Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Carl Uwe Knausgaard's new novel, The Morning Star, translated from the Norwegian by the incomparable Martin Atkin. Carl Uwe Knausgaard is one of my favorite authors, uh, and he is most famous, of course, for his six volume Mean Comp My Struggle series, which is a pretty polarizing series. Some people love it, and other people hate it because, well, it's about nothing, really. I happen to fall into the camp of people who love it. But my introduction to Karl Uwe Knausgaard was his earlier work, A Time for Everything, which was published uh, in English by Archipelago Books. And this book is an incredible novel that is a retelling of all of these biblical stories in which angels and humans meet. It retells the Cain and Abel story, it retells um, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Noah and the building of the ark. But the moments in the Bible that that book is most interested in retelling are these moments where the divine and the mundane meet physically, where angels and humans meet. And it's just a really great book. It's one that I, I think is kind of underread. Um, I can never look at seagulls the same way again after reading that book, but I highly recommend reading that book. It's, it's a really good one. But the reason I begin a review of The Morning Star with talking about a time for everything is that in this new novel, Carlo Bacanalsgar is going back to a lot of these same themes that he explored so effectively in A Time for Everything. He's interested in this book, in this same relationship between the sacred and the mundane, the unearthly and the earthly, that which we can't explain and that which we can. But for those who have read the My Struggle series, um, this book is still full of those, for better or worse, those long-winded descriptions about the most mundane things and most mundane actions. In The Morning Star, just like in the My Struggle series, we're focused on altogether boring, normal people living boring, normal lives. Except for here, in A Morning Star, or The Morning Star, something strange is happening. See, something happens that really shouldn't happen, something that is kind of beyond scientific understanding. It doesn't really make sense, but it's also something that doesn't really matter that much. But people don't like when they don't understand something. What happens is a new star appears, and it's just there. There isn't anything particularly special about this new star, except that it's pretty bright, and it's just there. It wasn't there before, but now it is. And now it's something that every human being uh, needs to accept into their reality. It's now a part of their daily lives. And this star's appearance sets off everything that happens in this book. There's a very uneasy vibe and a very uneasy tone throughout this entire book because coincidentally, or not coincidentally, we never really figure out, a lot of weird kind of supernatural stuff starts happening all over uh, Norway. Um, and the characters aren't sure if these supernatural or uncanny things have anything to do with this new star. But they begin finding themselves in these situations that stress their previously held belief systems. These encounters with the inexplicable. In A Time for Everything, these were encounters with angels. Here, they're sort of all different kinds of strange occurrences. And let me actually just quickly read the scene in which Arna, our first viewpoint, a middle-aged man who is a university professor, um, the moment that he sees this star, he's driving down the road, um, and it just says, suddenly there was a crunching noise from under the wheels. It sounded like a series of small explosions. I slammed on the brakes. Was that a flat tire? No. There was something on the road, all over the road. They looked like pebbles, but they were moving. I opened the door and got out cautiously. And then I saw that there were crabs. Crabs in their hundreds. They made a ticking sound. Fucking hell. What was going on? I went back to the car and got in and shut the door. They kept coming, crawling out onto the road from the grass. I gulped some more of the whiskey and lit another cigarette. It was like they were answering the call of some other power, as if they were drawn by a light. But on land? Ugh. They were steered by instinct. And why shouldn't instinct break down like everything else? I sat for a while, hesitating to turn on the ignition, for there was no way I could carry on without running them over. Then, just when I'd, I'd got myself together and put the car into gear, 
to slowly make my way, the sky flared over the ridge at the end of the plain. It looked like the forest was on fire. But it was a heavenly body, I realized, for the light ascended into the sky, separating itself from the ridge in moments. It was a star. And what a star. So you can see, I hope, this confluence of the mundane and the supernatural in these unexplainable occurrences. There are few things as mundane and earthly as crabs, but they're acting a bit funny, right? And because we're humans, we're readers, we, like the characters, must read into this. What's this a sign of? What does it symbolize? Um, I actually, this actually reminds me quite a bit of how Mattis in Tarje Vesas as the Birds reads all the different signs of the woodcock. And I think Knausgaard might actually be referencing and playing a bit with how people throughout human history have interpreted and understood astrological signs, like the various appearances of Halley's Comet throughout history. Halley's Comet hangs out in the sky for about two weeks, I think every like 86 years or something like that. And for so long, every 86 years, people have just become absolutely flabbergasted at what this giant red new star in the sky means. It just appears one day, hangs out for two weeks, and then just disappears. And what's particularly interesting about Halley's Comet is that it comes past Earth uh, in regular intervals, meaning we can count back every 86 years since its last appearance and see in what year people were seeing this comet. And of course, people wrote about this thing for the last few thousand years. For example, in 1066, it's a pretty important year in British history, uh, Halley's Comet made an appearance. It's depicted on the famous Bayou Tapestry. But all of these chronicles from 1066 in England, in Britain, they all note this, this comet, and they suggest that it must be a sign that something big is going to happen. And well, it does. On, on October 14th, when William the Bastard of Normandy defeats King Harold II of England uh, in a field near the town of Hastings, and becomes William the Conqueror, King of England. All of these chroniclers read the appearance of this new comet and try to divine meaning from it. It must be an omen, in their worldview, from God. And fans of Game of Thrones will actually note a similar thing. Um, George R. R. Martin is clearly referencing um, this, this moment in 1066 where this comet appeared um, in the second season of Game of Thrones and in the first and second books. Um, where the bright red star appears in the sky over Westeros. But in both of these instances, mapping meaning onto unexplainable phenomena is necessary in some ways to remain sane. We have to give things meaning, otherwise we just live in a chaotic world. And so in the Morning Star, we see this star appear from the perspective of all nine of our characters. And strange stuff starts happening to each of these characters all over the course of just the two days that this novel takes place in. Katrina, the priest, um, sees a dead man on more than one occasion. Iselin, the psychology student, runs into a, a seemingly madman who keeps calling himself, who, who keeps saying that he is the Lord, etc. And most of these occurrences fall under the realm of the uncanny. That is, they aren't wholly supernatural. They're more just natural, but a bit skewed, which is for me almost more disturbing, right? Crabs are pretty normal, but herds of crabs are running across a highway in Western Norway. That's pretty bizarre. And to be fair, there are many more different, um, perhaps more uncanny appearances in this book. But these characters are all vastly different from each other. But importantly, all, not, all nine of these viewpoints are told from the first person singular. And this fact does seem important. These characters are, again, very different, but they're all looking at the exact same thing and interpreting different things from that thing. And they're all, and since they're all told in the first person, they all kind of start blending together. It's polyphonic in a way. As we're put into all of these characters' heads one after the other, and we see all of these characters both from their own perspective, from the inside of their own heads, and from the outside, from the perspective of other characters. And if you've read the My Struggle series, you'll see that a lot of these characters bear striking similarities to Karl Uwe Knausgar himself. Katrina, the priest, is working on a new Norwegian translation of the Bible, just like Knausgar did. Arna's wife is dealing with um, bipolar disorder and, 
episodes of Psychosis and stuff like that, just like Knausgar's wife did. And I usually hate biographical readings of novels, but I've read 3,600 pages of this guy writing about his life, so I will make connections. But joking aside, I think this is actually thematically important. A lot of critics ha have noted that all of these characters sound like just different sides of Knausgar himself, the Knausgar we, we met in my struggle, which if this was a character-based novel would be a problem, but I don't think this character is necessarily, uh, I don't think this book is necessarily about the characters themselves. But let me back up a little bit. What is the Morning Star? The term the Morning Star uh, sometimes refers to the planet Venus, right? Because it's often pretty bright and you can often see it in the morning after all the other stars have faded away. But clearly in The Morning Star, it's a biblical illusion, which if you're reading Car Carluva Kanausgar, you better be ready to encounter. The problem with The Morning Star, the term The Morning Star, is that in the Bible, it refers to both Jesus and Satan. Isaiah 14, 12 in the uh, New International Version reads, How you have fallen from heaven, Morning Star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to earth, you who once laid low the nations. This is, of course, referring to Satan or Lucifer, whose name Lucifer simply just means bright one. Um, but then in Revelations 22, 16, we get, I, Jesus, have sent my angels to, to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star, which is clearly labeling Jesus as the morning star. So we have these two figures who are, of course, philosophically, uh, uh, theologically, and cosmically opposed to each other, both being referred to by the same name, the Morning Star. There's an inherent conflict within this term, and some of our characters uh, in this book recognize this conflict. But what's interesting here, and what I think might be helpful when approaching this book, is that both of these uh, examples from Isaiah and Revelations are both coming from different languages. Isaiah from the Hebrew and uh, Revelations from the Greek. And I don't want to like spend too much time and get bogged down on this point because I don't know either Hebrew nor Greek, but Knausgar has worked on a translation of the Bible, just like Katrina does in uh, the novel. Um, and so this idea that a single title, a single um, noun phrase, can refer to either one thing or the complete and exact opposite of that same thing, I think says a lot about interpretation, about linguistic interpretation and literary interpretation. That is, this is in some ways a, an idea that the, the Romantics struggled with quite a bit when trying to understand nature. A hurricane is both terrifying and beautiful, threatening and sublime. And this more general idea of how do we interpret signs from the world is something that humans have always struggled with and have always come into conflict with each other over how we do this. Think of how differently, for instance, the Romantics and the Surrealists uh, interpret nature. How do they both, how do people in these groups divine knowledge from nature differently? Whatever they might divine, what's common between all of them is that they do divine meaning from, well, everything. We all do this. We can't not. Egil in the book is a sort of drunk who is a really bad parent and who lives kind of in a cabin in the woods that his parents own, is reminded of the star one morning after he wakes up hungover. And he goes out to look at it. And it reads, the new star, was it still there? I got up and went out to the veranda. The star was still shining in the north. Even then, in the morning, the sun in the sky, clearly it was strong, or close, a morning star. I am the bright morning star, Jesus said. But in Isaiah, the morning star was the devil. Wasn't that right? I'd have to check. And just a little while later on the next page, we get the star was obviously a sign, but of what? It would become apparent soon enough. But where and to whom? And we're not given an answer in this book. Well, in some ways, we're given nine different quasi answers from each different characters' perspective. Some characters in this novel view it as a negative sign, others view it as a positive sign, but because this is a horror novel, uh, almost everyone sees it as a, as a different kind of negative sign. Egil, perhaps more than other characters in this novel, thinks about these questions most directly. He is, in many ways, uh, in his views of art and religion and spirituality, most closely aligned 
with the Kanalsgar of my struggle. Um, he's always referencing uh, Kierkegaard and Hölderlin and Nietzsche and all these different philosophers that, again, Knausgaard references all the time in my struggle. And in a long chapter that opens up the second part of this book, he contemplates art and religion and how humans need to be attached to systems of meaning. And he has this whole monologue um, thinking about whether humans can exist outside of those systems of meaning or not. But he comes to the Morning Star, and I think that this passage is just worth reading quickly uh, in full. The Morning Star was called Lucifer in Latin, which meant bearer of light. Here in Isaiah, Lucifer was a son of the morning, and the son of the morning could normally hardly be anything else but God, the creator of all things. Lucifer was thus aspiring to become his equal, but was banished from heaven into the kingdom of the dead, over which traditionally he was then considered to rule. On the face of it, the passage would have us believe that Lucifer was the son of God. But in the oldest parts of the Bible, the relationship between the different characters are often unclear, the nature of the angels being particularly inscrutable. In one place, we're told that the angels mingled with the daughters of men, who begat them children, who, for a time, wandered the earth as giants, while elsewhere the distinction between God and the angels is often fluid and uncertain. Moreover, the word son could, of course, be construed in a looser sense, meaning created by. But it was striking nonetheless that in other passages, Jesus, who was the Son of God, was likewise refers to, referred to as the Morning Star, which is to say, Lucifer. The angel Lucifer, the Morning Star, had been banished from heaven to earth. Now the Morning Star shone once more from the sky. So what did that mean? Not that I believed the star to be Lucifer or Christ. The star was a star. But I had no doubt that it was a sign of something. I swallowed a mouthful of Pepsi. It was diluted now. The ice cubes already melted. So there's this sort of yearning there, right? Egil realizes that the star is just a star, but he refuses to accept that simple conclusion. That can't be the end of it. It's too simple. It's too ordinary. There needs to be something more. There is this creeping existential dread that is really apparent in the My Struggle series, this continuation with the mundanity in the face of its own meaninglessness. It's evident here in the Morning Star as well. This dread in the Morning Star, though, is personified supernaturally into the uncanny. And I just like this passage quite a bit because the mundanity of the 21st century is never too far from Knausgar's pen. I just love that after this long thought about the uh, diametrically opposed connection between Christ and Lucifer, he then takes a sip of Pepsi. But what we see here, what we see throughout this book, is the mundane being imbued with meaning by humans, like the romantics that Knausgar likes uh, so much, as we learned in the My Struggle series. Here, Egil is also trying to embed the world around him with meaning, embed the mundane with meaning. And of course, this mundane is never that far from the divine, from higher meaning. This desire, whether it's noble or naive, I don't really know, but in his other books, there is this just search for something more, and it's evident here as well, something more concrete and meaningful. In the My Struggle series, there's a lot of discussions about this and about the search for the divine, um, as, as he calls it. And he notes how silly he probably sounds in the 21st century, searching for the divine um, on a couple different occasions. But here in the Morning Star, as in some of his essays in The Land of the Cyclops, which I forgot to put up in my Knausgar shrine behind me, um, there, the divine blends with both art and death as the only sort of absolutes in a world that is becoming increasingly devoid of absolutes. And a horror novel is actually a really good medium for Knausgar to continue exploring these ideas that he's been exploring for a couple decades now, as he's able to probe this existential dread in a way that's more pressing, in a way that's more pressingly scary. There are so many long meditations in this novel about art and life and most prominently, of course, um, is death. Um, in fact, this book actually includes this really long and really amazing, in my opinion, sequence in which one of the characters sort of travels to uh, some form of the underworld, kind of Dante style, though sort of mixed with some of Tarkovsky's uh, stalker. Um, 
in, in this really in this really interesting sequence. And of course, this book ends with a 40 odd page essay on death, which importantly culminates and finishes on the last page of the novel, page 666. This book often feels like Knausgaard was writing it to be made into an anthology miniseries. I can totally see this book being made into a nine episode TV show with each episode focusing on one character. Some of the stories intertwine with each other, but at no point do they all fully converge, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? They don't all need to come together in the end, but what we're left with in this book at the end it isn't quite a unified whole. It ends up like his My Struggle series and even his A Time for Everything, just kind of ed ending. The meditation just comes to an unresolved end and the search for meaning continues. This book is messy in a lot of ways. Again, not necessarily in bad ways, but there are just so many of those Knausgar moments of brilliance that I've come to love with his writing. Um, but I do realize that it's quite polarizing. So there are so many strands of this book that I just completely left out. I feel like I just gave the most shallow review possible as I barely touched on any of it. Um, I'll leave some other reviews uh, down below in the, description in the description box, but I would strongly encourage you to check out the interview done with Knausgar um, and Brandon Taylor. Uh, Taylor is a really good interviewer um, and Knausgar is for some reason, I, I love watching Knausgar interviews. He's really good in interviews. He's like very coy, but also very elegant in his answers. Um, and it's a great conversation. They speak a lot more coherently than I'm able to hear. So for me, Knausgar is one of the more exciting writers today. Um, I'll read really anything he puts out. Um, I just love his voice and his style. But as is probably clear, and as I'll freely admit, um, I had trouble wrapping my head around this book. I finished it um, over a month ago and I had to let it sit um, and stew for quite a bit of time to kind of wrap my head around parts. Of, I mean, I don't think I've even fully processed the My Struggle series yet, um, but I did think that it would be important to put out this review now in the state that it is um, and see if anyone else has any thoughts on this. Um, it's likely a book that I'll be rereading in 2022, um, but please let me know if you've read uh, Knausgar's new work and what you think of it. I'm really interested to continue this conversation, but for now, thanks for watching.